Okay, guys, let's get going. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all. I want to get the panel going with, um, with a different intro question. So I would like for each of you to introduce yourselves. But um, because we're talking about the regional economic development and the regional progress, uh, I would like to uh, introduce yourselves um, within the regional context and kind of talk about how you made your way into the world of startups, investing, and um, what did the regional ecosystem look like when you first started and where it stands right now. And you cover, you come from different regions. So I think uh, what, how Caldon answers this question will be very different uh, from Dimitris and Andrea. Sure. So maybe maybe I'll start. So uh, prior to uh, getting into the VC business, I was a founder. And um, throughout uh, the last uh, 15 years or so, or 20 years maybe, I've been switching roles between both sides of the table, both as, as a founder and as a venture capitalist. And uh, I can't, uh, you know, I can't come to commit to being one or the other. So I'm enjoying being both. Uh, I would say that the most important things that happened in the last 10 years since we started Imina, when we started Imina, we were riding on the wave of increased penetration of smartphone. And that was a very strong and, uh, you know, wave that, that enabled us to build so many businesses. I would say that as of this year, we're riding on another wave, which is accelerated digitization across the region or across you know the different industries so i would say in the MENA region one of the unique things is that consumer adoption came before sme and businesses adoption and what we're going to see in the next five to ten years is increased adoption by businesses in the region which will match up with consumer adoption hopefully helping with the maturity of the regional ecosystem I can go second then. Hi everyone, um, my name is Andrea. Originally, as you might understand from my name and surname, I'm Italian, uh, but I came to London around seven years ago. Uh, my background was first in the financial sector and then in the startup space. So I also started as an entrepreneur and I launched my own company here in London. And then after investing in the blockchain space for a while, I decided to set up a fund with other three friends that at the time used to work for BlackRock here in London. And uh, since then we set, I mean, we run like Eterna Capital, which is an investment firm uh, operating in the blockchain space. Uh, we, a couple of years ago, we launched our first fund, which is very successful. Now we're about to launch our second fund. And also on the side, we're also running uh, an accelerator which is focused on one of the projects that uh, we have invested in with our first fund called Algorand. And uh, actually we have applications now open for that if there is any startup interested uh, listening to this. And um, yeah, I mean, I think since I moved to London, you know, the startup space has evolved quite a lot. Of course, here FinTech is quite big. Uh, and I see that now people uh, also in this COVID situation, they're trying, you know, to adapt. But I see that in particular, like, purely digital businesses they're seeing like an acceleration of you know what the trend could have been like taking uh, five years is going a lot faster because people realize that as you're doing now they need to find virtual ways to and digital ways to connect Dimitris? and i will yeah, I'll, I'll close uh, the intersection thank you to say so uh, i'm a, i'm a lawyer by academia so initially I spent my time in in London, UK, uh, doing just that. And about ten years ago, I decided to to go back in Greece. I'm originally from from Athens, Greece. Uh, since uh, I just want you know to be back and uh, see what I can do for the local scene. I was always very enthusiastic about uh, the local tech scene, which uh, back then was uh, more or less just a handful of people. Really, uh, I, I can remember the first meetups we had. Uh, in early 2010, it was just uh, 10, 15. Uh, we have we have uh, come down a long way since then, definitely. Uh, 2020, uh, COVID, uh, COVID aside, 
was uh, quite quite a, a positive uh, year for the Greek ecosystem. We experienced uh, some major first exit by international companies. Microsoft acquired a local RPA software company, and uh, we had a very big uh, exit from uh, uh, from a Greeks Greek based but actually active in the MENA region region company Stasop uh, lately. And I would argue that you know. The, the ingredients in the different parts of the ecosystems are finally coming together. There is um, more experience as far as uh, entrepreneurs themselves are concerned. Uh, there. I think we can uh, discuss more about that later on. And uh, we have uh, quite a few good cases right now that can eventually act as role models uh, for the next generation for, of, of entrepreneurs to try to mimic uh, and uh, to follow their examples. So uh, that's the that's the Athens and Greece update in less than two minutes. Um, so um, thank you for that um, intro. And my next question is for more for um, Kaldun and Dimitris, unless Andrea, you want to answer it with your Italian hat. Um, so in the last ten years, we have seen a lot of fund of funds, a lot of regional VCs forming up in. Uh, in the Middle East, in Italy, in Greece, these are uh, things that didn't really exist 10 years ago. And um, so the question is twofolded. One is, how do you think um, the formation of local fund of funds, regional fund of funds, local VCs, regional VCs contribute to the um, economic growth and technology growth of the region? And the second question is, um, how do you make sure that when you care about high returns as an LP, as an investor, you, you keep the money in the region and yet you have to balance it with, with again, high returns as well. What I'm trying to say, we also see a lot of like money going out of these regions to top performing UK uh, companies and Silicon Valley companies and uh, Boston companies. So how do you balance that? How do you make sure that the money actually stays in the region and contributes to the economic development? Uh, I'll take that first. So, uh, first of all, even if we consider all of the new funds of funds that were started in countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like Bahrain, in places like Abu Dhabi, even Jordan and Egypt, if, even if we put all of that together, the amount of the funds that has been allocated for venture capital in the region remains extremely small compared to other uh, region and countries. So it's still probably, you know, less than one or two percent when you compare it to other more, more developed, uh, more developed ecosystem. The second thing that we need to keep in mind is that most of those uh, organizations or institutes are, are government owned and government managed. So it's taking them quite a bit of time to adapt to how VCs work, decision making cycles remain remain very long and you know requirements and processes remain with with a high level of friction having said that you know the effect that those uh, funds of funds have had has been tremendous on on the public opinion and perception of venture capital in the region so it's been a validation or sort of, a, sort of an endorsement by government in a region where businesses and to many extent consumers have followed in many ways, you know, the lead of governments. So sort of, you know, highly regulated economies uh, and, and, highly, and highly regulated industries. So it definitely has encouraged many family offices to go ahead and make allocations for venture capital. And it has encouraged many founders to go ahead and start entrepreneurs. So we're seeing a new wave or a new generation. Obviously, that's been you know supported and helped tremendously with founders who are coming out of uh, companies like Kareem that had you know a significant exit and Souk.com, etc. So those founders are are coming out and starting their own businesses. However, what we're seeing is that you know uh, there is initial excitement. Uh, by by VCs and uh, and by and by fund of funds and by family offices to make a bunch of investments 
And then as they realize that the cycle of venture capital is a very long one, you know, and as they see that the first probably one to three years are the most difficult ones in startups, they're holding back and waiting to see what happens with their initial investments. So this is causing a glitch or a significant gap with, you know, Series A and uh, and and growth funding uh, uh, basically cycles cycles in the region. So I would say that you know overall this will definitely be posit positive over the long term. However, it will take a lot of time to materialize. Um, obviously, you know investors in the region are following return and deals and. Uh, they will continue to invest the majority of their money outside the region. So for every dollar that's invested in the region, there'll probably be you know, at least 10 or $20 invested outside the region, especially for, for prudent investors. Now, is there really a way to synergize and get an impact on the region from your investments outside the region? I haven't seen that happening in any meaningful way beyond, you know, publicity and press releases. But hopefully this will. I think the main, you know, factor that will help to mature the, the ecosystem in the region will be seeing more, more, more successful startups. And probably the most positive effect will be encouraging, you know, highly qualified founders to basically go ahead and start their businesses. Those are founders that are used to the security of, you know, good paying jobs, the security of government and corporate positions. Now that they see some liquidity available in the market, they're going to probably go ahead and start their own businesses. And we've been seeing some of that, but, but overall it's still very early days for the, for the ecosystem. And Andre, yeah. Andre, I know I, I will that... definitely echo. Oh, Go ahead. Sorry, I, I just was about to ask to add. Uh, I will I will definitely echo uh, Cardon uh, in, in in supporting the fact that uh, still uh, we are running behind in terms of absolute numbers compared to the GDP that money is you know com uh, invested in in, uh, in this part of Europe, uh, Greece, for example, where where uh, 0.83% of the GDP, where the European average is uh, 1.4. Having said that, uh, I think we have to acknowledge also the fact that uh, the VC as an asset class for family offices, for pension funds, is, is not really well known in this part of Europe. So what, what these government-led initiatives really are trying to make is really to, to ignite and introduce a VC as an asset class for these players so they can really ignite the local VC scene, uh, where eventually for fund number two and fund number three, the idea is that the teams will, will start having some sort of a narrative and some even even non-materialized but still some good numbers or so from from their portfolio companies so they will go after a more market driven fund number two and number three where they actually do not really receive uh more support uh by by any regional or government-led initiative as far as the second point of the question is concerned how we balance uh, the uh, our LP uh, anticipation in terms of uh, financial returns and the, the regional innovation growth. What, what we really uh, are saying, and this is one of the, the key ways to uh, attract uh, teams, not only based in Greece, but also foreign teams will be eventually looking to open an R&D tech office in Greece, is that the technology in the region, in Greece, in Romania, in Turkey, in Bulgaria, uh, is is way above the average, whereas at the same time the cost of living and the cost, the company cost uh, to set up an, a local R&D office is way below uh, major European hubs or US hubs. So most of our companies they they very much like the fact that uh, they can operate uh, the, the technology team out of Athens or out of Bucharest or out of Istanbul. At the same time have uh, the business people, uh, th those who are after uh, the sales of, of the venture, uh, really you know, focus around the main geographies, whether this is continental Europe or, or the US. We have also for our piece. We support high growth uh, companies that have some sort of a local presence, 
where at the same time embrace them to go global from num uh, from day number one in terms of market penetration and market focus. And I want to add something um, in there. You mentioned introducing venture capital as an asset class to family offices, and that's something very dear to my heart as a cause because with Angel Labs, we started doing venture capital education programs for family offices in 2013, and we've done it in 44 countries. So I know the challenge, but something changed, I think, with COVID. Um, tech was one of the few industries that didn't really lose much value in the, in the market. And, and, and it's the first time property developers, real estate people, anyone who comes from old wealth, um, kind of started looking at tech as a potential asset class. But what do you think, um, and this question is for all three of you, what is, what is stopping your average family office that doesn't know much about venture capital from investing in funds and startups right now? What are the biggest challenges? I think if I can start, like uh, uh, given the focus that we have, which is blockchain, sometimes there is uh, an educational element which is needed. So we understand that given that blockchain is such a new technology, sometimes people uh, make the wrong analogy, blockchain equal Bitcoin equal cryptocurrency, which is not true. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is this element that sometimes is on hurdle and uh, even, you know, uh, having the right legal structure uh, for such a business focus on this sector was not uh, easy. So now after like a few years, we have like a fully regulated fund where we can actually attract more like institutional investors. So I think for us, that's the key element. Then from a COVID standpoint, I think as you said, uh, people realize that, uh, you know, technology is very important and uh, the future is uh, around technology. And uh, this accelerated the trend of, uh, you know, even making people realize that even conferences like this one, we can also, you know, achieve pretty much similar results in terms of content by doing it virtual. Then, of course, you sometimes lose the uh, human element, which is still very important. So in an ideal world, I think you strike the right balance. And then I want to quickly also touch on your previous questions about, you know, the regional developments, because in Italy uh, is quite interesting. They recently actually announced a one billion dollar fund. They're trying to basically set up a venture capital strategy for the next couple of years. And this fund will invest directly in startups. But then we will also have a segment just dedicated as a fund of funds. So I think, of mm -hmm. course, the VC space is small there, but they're trying to undertake steps to ensure that uh, they can attract uh, startups in Italy and they can actually uh, support them as well. From the UK standpoint, which is you know where I work, um, I think here the VC space is very well developed and there are you know there's plenty of activity from uh, an investor standpoint uh, on any level, from you know angel investor, family office to even more institutional investors. Kaldun, do you have any any um, points to add on there? What do you think stops um, regional family offices from investing in BC? Uh, I believe seeing returns. So you know those kind of investors are are used to basically you know seeing a predictable cycle of investing, returning capital, having liquidity, and having exposure. So. Uh, you know, in, in general, what we've seen is a very steep learning curve. So a lot of those family offices are interested in learning. They're interested in receiving material. They're interested in having calls. And then when it comes to making decisions, they're unable to actually, you know, uh, basically follow a process and then handle the legal and, uh, and due diligence work that enables them to invest. And most importantly, they haven't seen returns. So when, when, the Karim invest, when the Karim exit, for example, happened, every principal head of a family office called his investment manager and asked him, hey, you know, do we have any exposure to Karim? And you know, the investment managers told them, well, this is a company that knocked on our doors for 15 times. And every time you said the valuation was too high or the company was too risky. So we passed on this investment all those 15 times. So now they're telling them next time we get we get another Kareem, you know, please let's pay more attention to it and let's take a little a little bit of risk. So 
uh, I would say that, you know, seeing seeing exits and hopefully one of the things that we're planning is, you know, uh, uh, exploring having a, a listed investment company that enables ultra high net worth individuals and family offices to make investments that they can buy and sell anytime where they don't have to do the DD whenever they want to make an investment and where they have diversification to a number of portfolio companies. And this is something that we've seen, you know, in countries like, for example, you know, Russia, where companies like Vostok, you know, enabled access to the early ecosystem in Russia. We're seeing it in the UK with a number of listed VCs and we're seeing it in other places. So maybe this will encourage family offices and ultra high net worth individuals to make more allocation to, to the VC asset space. I think I, I have more questions prepared for you, but I think we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you, uh, the Brazil team for having me. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye.